this week on Two-Faced Wrestling Talk. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Ishii? Yes, the Stone Pitbull took to the skies in the G1 in a match of the year candidate. That's just one of the many moments we'll be discussing from the G1 Climax. AEW drops the news of when their TV show will debut, while NWA says goodbye to ROH. Speaking of ROH, it was a big weekend of action in the Northeast, where Dem Boys are once again Dem Champs, but they aren't done with G.O.D. just yet. We will break down Manhattan Mayhem and Mass Hysteria. And in WWE, they are starting to look ahead to SummerSlam, but they took time to look back on Raw. We will give our thoughts on the Raw reunion and more next. WrestlingInc.com brings you Two-Faced Wrestling Talk, the podcast that goes beyond WWE and goes in depth on NJPW. AEW, ROH, PWG, and more. Also featuring fun pop culture and wrestling crossovers, listener Q&As, and extended discussions about wrestling topics past, present, and future. Now, here's your host, Kelsey. Hi, and welcome to Two-Face Wrestling Talk. I'm joined, as usual... But my co-host, Paul. Yes, I have made it back from steamy Delaware, and I'm back here next to you. And I don't think I'm leaving you for a while, I don't think. Oh, I guess that's, that's good. <laughs> I don't think I have any travel up- upcoming for work. Was so. that really just last week? It was really last week. It feels like a month when ago. We, when we recorded it at like 2 in the morning again. Oh, yeah. After my many flight delays just trying to get to the Philadelphia area. Yeah. So, on time tonight. So I'm recording at a normal time. I'm very excited about it. I'm just as exhausted as last week, though. <laughs> yes, you've had a busy week at work. Yes, producing six shows by the time the week's over and one podcast. So yeah. six TV shows, one podcast. I think that's pretty good for you, one person. Yeah. You are a busy little bee. Yes. But now it's time to talk about wrestling. Let's So let's get busy with that. But um, before we do, let's thank our good friends at WrestlingTravel.org. Yeah. They, uh... Have been great partners with us thus far, and uh, hey, we're only a few weeks out from All Out. Not uh, too late to try and get a package. No, not at all. Check them out. Go to wrestlingtravel.org or find them on social media. If you have any questions, they'll be happy to answer them for you. Check them out at Wrestling Travel. They really are really cool people. There was a great write-up on them. Uh, I really enjoyed the article quite a bit, and it just... From reading it, it's like these people are passionate about wrestling and about giving wrestling fans the experience of seeing wrestling live and in person. Because I think that's really a special thing. And you tweeted that article out on your social media at Super Kicking It. And I, of course, retweeted it at PBoron88. So (laughs) you can find that great article on wrestling travel. And uh, once again, we thank them for their support. But speaking of All Out, it's time to give our opinions on the latest wrestling shows, news, and developments. It's time for headlines. And we will get to All Out in a moment, but the big news that came out on uh, Thursday is we finally have a day of the week that uh, the AEW TV show will air on TNT and what will be the official debut date, October 2nd. Yeah, um, it's going to be on Wednesdays, which you were saying that they should go on Tuesdays. Well, I initially was, but I wasn't thinking about TNT when it comes to the NBA season, where they have games on Thursday night, and a lot of times they have games on Tuesday night. So Wednesday is perfect for them in the schedule. And I think it's interesting because they it puts them up against NXT, which I would think... Even though we were talking and have been talking about AEW being a threat to WWE, Mm -hmm. the brand that WWE has out there that's most similar to the style of wrestling is NXT. That's most comparable to AEW because that's the brand where guys cut actual promos instead of interviews and there's actual good long wrestling matches. So. That's Usually, be, yes. But, I mean, that Keith Lee and Punishment Martinez could have been longer. Well, now he's Damian Priest, but yes. that match could have been longer. Yeah, that uh, that we will get to a little bit in WWE. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, and with the talent they have, um, it, it, that'll be an interesting head-to-head. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see. We're already hearing rumors of how will NXT go to FS1? Will 205 Live merge with NXT to have a beefed up two-hour show? Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of rumors, but uh, as a wrestling fan, 
makes for a very fun Wednesday night, that's for sure. Yeah, it sure does. I mean, it'll be interesting to see unfold. I'm definitely really looking forward to the first night of AEW because, like, what are they going to do? They have to do something big. I feel like they're going to pull out all the stops. So to me, it's like, it could be something really neat and surprising. I don't know. I just, I got to tune in. And I think there's like an aura around it. And yet, I'm not saying that NXT, if it moves to FS1, it won't be just as exciting. But I think there's a real excitement about it being the first one. Oh, yeah. The first, like, other company on a main channel in a long time. So to me, it's like such a huge deal, just the thought of it. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, too, because it'll also give, as the shows go along, it, to me, it's going to be like Raw versus Nitro in that from week to week, you have to decide which one you want to watch live and which one you want to record and watch later because uh, I'm sure most people will still probably watch both when it comes to NXT. So that'll be interesting, too. If NXT does essentially move to FS1. Yeah, yeah. otherwise otherwise you're still committed to getting the network to see NXT, so Mm -hmm. that's a big thing, too. So uh, I think uh, it's a good move by AEW. We've heard the rumor that it's going to be called Wednesday Night Dynamite. Uh, Not sure if I'm thrilled with that name. If that is it, it is. It does seem like it is a little play on Nitro, though. <laughs> They're doing a lot of fire-themed stuff with their graphics, so it could mean that it is going to be called Dynamite, you know, Explosions, Fire. Kind of all goes together with the graphics I've been seeing. But uh, that's just rumors as of right now. Nothing's confirmed, but... Yeah, other than the fact that that name has been trademarked, so mm-hmm. we'll see uh, if that is the case. Uh, Wednesday Night Dynamite on TNT. Has a pretty good ring to well, it, TNT, I think. TNT, Dynamite, Yeah, you know. exactly. <laughs> TNT, <laughs> yeah. Dynamite. <laughs> that goes. Yeah, there you go. Sure. I just connected it just now. Yeah, that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. Yes. Did you think of yes. it? No, but I'm, I, meant your, I meant your singing. <laughs> oh, I wasn't trying with that. I was just being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you were successful. <laughs> hey, whatever. <laughs> uh that wasn't the only uh, thing we uh, want to talk about about AEW. We really both really enjoyed the newest Road to All Out video. I thought it, it was fantastic. It, you know, it captured a lot of the emotion. Really well edited from your friend. Man, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> Stop stealing my stuff, my words and things. Yes, my friend Louie did a great job. He did a lot of the editing for that latest All Out video, uh, Road to All Out video. And I... I just thought it was really, really well B-rolled. And for those of you not in TV, that's like (laughs) the footage you see where it's not an interview or not somebody talking. It's the footage of people doing things that they put over interviews. That's called B-roll footage usually. So I thought some of the B-roll footage was really, really well done. Like I loved the whole Tully Blanchard explaining why he's kind of uh, mentoring Ty Dillinger. Sean Spears, of course. And I thought that was really a great backstory because, like, you know, why are they connected together? That whole little section of the video gave really great insight to that and gave a reason behind it. It wasn't just random anymore when they explained it out like that. And the John Moxley promo and the setting up of that uh, triple threat match now. I'm super excited about that triple threat, although there's parts of me that are, like, you know, he hasn't shined in matches with four guys, and I'm talking about Jimmy Havoc, of course. Will he shine in a triple threat? He better shine because people are not impressed with him. I mean, I am, but people who don't already know him like us aren't really impressed with with what they've seen from what I've been reading online, and that really bums me out because he's amazing, and I've said this week after week, but uh, maybe this match he'll finally shine. But man, the two other guys in the match with him, Janela and Darby, they're amazing too, and it's going to be a crazy, insane, just wild match. Yeah. I mean, it might make you wince, but I, I can't wait. Yeah, I, I, I am worried about Jimmy Havoc being able to stand out here because Janelle obviously is wildly popular. Darby Allen is now over after his match with Cody back at Fighter Fest. So it'll be interesting to see if Jimmy Havoc gets a chance to kind of shine and show why he's so great but yeah it's like jimmy didn't have that chance janella got the main event against moxley and then like you said darby had that awesome match against cody which really elevated him quite a bit i mean even janella got elevated by having that main event match like i like i said too so what has happened to make havoc elevated so now it's like two elevated popular guys against a guy that they haven't really shined 
anything on. Didn't shine a spotlight on him yet. So hopefully they'll take the time in this match to do some specific spots that make him look really, really good, really hardcore, and make the audience really want to root for him. Well, speaking of AEW, guys, uh, shortly before we recorded tonight, news broke that uh, a lot of the AEW guys who were going to be wrestling this weekend at Wrestle Circus suddenly aren't working because Wrestle Circus has uh, shut down their promotion. Supposedly, the owner says he's getting out of the wrestling business. If this is true, this is so weird. They just started back up not that long ago. You and I stumbled upon Wrestle Circus, God, a year and a half ago? When was that? Two years ago, even? Yeah, yeah. two we summers ago. randomly to Austin. Austin, and we were just looking in, like, the... I guess it's kind of like what we call, like, a Lanyat magazine, which is, like, a magazine with things to do. It was like that, but for Austin... But you have to explain what Lanyap is now. It's a... It's a people, Louisiana people don't term. Know? Nobody knows that. It's a Louisiana term. Nobody outside of Louisiana <laughs> has ever heard that term. Yes, they have. No, they haven't. Yes, Trust they have. Me. Trust me. I have never I never heard that term before I came. It means like extra bonus yes. or but it, but in this case it's the name of a paper as well here that has like cool stuff to do. Yeah, what's going it. on in your town? Yeah, that there's weekend. also one called like where you at, the same thing. Yeah. So, that's also that's a New Orleans thing like where you at? Yeah, I know. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah, I know, because it's too hard to say you at. Where yeah. are you at? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Not I, you at. Yeah, I know. But that's what I'm saying. It says it's too hard to say those two words, you at. So it's, uh, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> You're always talking bad about my people. <laughs> so wrong. But anyway, we saw it in this Lanyap type of paper. Uh, randomly, we're like, wrestling? What the heck is this? And we went to a Wrestle Circus show, and unfortunately, we couldn't stay the whole time. Because we had already bought these Queen cover band tickets, which was okay. But I really didn't want to leave the Wrestle Circus. That's how impressed I was. I was all bummed that we were leaving. I was like, oh, I want to stay. I want to stay. It was really, really amazing. And we saw MJF there, and he had toilet paper thrown at him in the ring. It was incredible. <laughs> I think Sammy was there, too. I'm not sure, though. Maybe he wasn't. No, but Scorpio Sky, that was the first time we had ever seen him, I know. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, yeah, it's... And look, you know, our, our good friend Anthony is a huge fan of the promotion because yeah. he lives in Texas and he was at that show where Tessa and Sammy Callahan squared off. So uh, that was just a few weeks ago. Exactly, because like after we saw them, they kind of went away for a little while. Then they came back and Anthony, like you said, was going to a, quite a few shows with his awesome wife, Olivia. <laughs> and now, what the heck? Yeah, disappointing. So yeah. Uh, hopefully it'll be revived, but uh, it's been tumultuous for Wrestle Circus for for sure, and uh, certainly disappointing for everybody that was looking forward to that show this weekend. So uh, that impacted Impact guys and AEW guys, and we talked about how AEW is going to impact NXT and the WWE, so that kind of leads us into our WWE discussion for the week. And we got to start with the Raw reunion. Uh, All right, yeah, let's get your thoughts. I hated it. <laughs> I hated all of it. Um, I like Stone Cold. I didn't hate that. Um, I'm a really big Stone Cold fan. And his fan. speech was really You good. can't see because your head's in the way. Where is it? I don't I know. I got a Stone Cold uh, magnet <laughs> up Here, there. Why don't I just completely get it <laughs> Well, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see behind Paul, there's an awesome Austin 316 magnet I got on my little magnet collection boards. All they can see is boards. Bill Murray. That's all you can see. Well, and then the big harsh light, we have to f- <laughs> figure out a way to stop that glare. But anyway, I really love Austin. I thought he did a great job with that promo at the end although it didn't get anybody over per se no i mean the whole night really didn't get any current stars over except for bray wyatt and that leads me into my problem with the raw reunion i've got no problem with doing the show once a year you could even do a raw one in march and a smackdown one in september just don't have any of the current guys in it just make it a nostalgia show have the entrances have the catchphrases just show classic matches from those guys when they come to the ring like like when like a clip special yeah almost yeah. you know hbk comes to the ring and 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 does his speech and then they show a classic Shawn michaels match i think that would be so much better than trying to work in samoa joe or Sami Zayn. and look they were both great you know, bashing the legends, which is what they're yeah, good at. But but it's awkward seeing all of them interact. Yeah. Like, I, I was reading on Twitter, because I didn't even think about this, but, you know, a few weeks ago, Triple H was kind of um, on AJ Styles' side in Japan, and the club side, and was, like, in the ring with them. Then all of a sudden, he's, <laughs> like, protecting Seth from them. It's really awkward. It's like a flip-flop. 
Yeah, well, again, just don't have your current talent on this and do this show once a year. Give all the current stars a week off, you know? They need a week off anyways. Give them a week off, have all your legends come in, and just have a show that is nostalgic because obviously people like it. It gave Raw one of its best ratings of the year, which isn't saying a lot because it's the ratings have been struggling. But, but here's the problem. It's it gave, not going to carry over. Right, because they didn't do anything for the current brand. So next week, it'll just go back to where it was. Right. I mean, the thing you're proposing wouldn't do anything for the current brand, but it wouldn't mix it so much and make it so awkward to watch. Right. I think it would be really, actually quite creative i like the idea a lot you didn't even tell me this before we filmed i like the whole idea of the clip show thing I even give, more i don't give you all my good stuff when we're not on camera i, I gotta i gotta save some of the gold for for the actual podcast so i can seem surprised <laughs> at some of your ideas that are all brilliant whatever yes. some of them are okay <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah so that being said uh when it comes to the actual current stars and the few storylines they've got going on another thing that bugged me and WWE does this all the time. Samoa Joe, Roman Reigns have a confrontation in the ring. Why don't you build that for SummerSlam? Why would you actually have a match on Monday night? Yeah. You know, or if you start the match, don't even have a finish. Have it break down into a disqualification. Because I'm sure they're going to go at it again at, at SummerSlam. I mean, you know that WWE's history of repeating matches multiple times. So... I just thought, as soon as they rang that bell, I'm like, why are they not saving this for SummerSlam? Yeah. It makes no sense. It's really hard to accept Samoa Joe's promos anymore. I love his promos, but, like, you know, they, they have him lose so much. Yeah. He just doesn't come off as, like, you believe that he's a threat anymore. Right. No, I agree. You know, and that sucks because he's, like, one of our favorites ever. He's not our friend Trace's favorite, but... <laughs> who thinks he's a thug? ridiculous like, our yeah. friend trace who who listens to our podcast but hardly ever watched wrestling is now watching wrestling and he likes roman reigns and he doesn't like samoa joe something's wrong here something's completely wrong <laughs> i am very confused how someone could have those thoughts i mean if you're gonna like reigns you gotta like samoa joe he's one of the best wrestlers ever one of the best promo guys i don't understand it no i don't either it's really weird. um another thing that is a pet peeve of yours is kofi is challenging Orton, apparently, at SummerSlam. Fantastic. Great. Yes, <laughs> but he's advertised for a different title match right before. Right. So they, they he does the challenge of, you know, we'll fight for the title at SummerSlam. But at the same time, they're promoting this special show they're running on Saturday where Kofi's going against Samoa Joe and Dolph Ziggler. Now, I know Kofi's going to retain, but why don't you give the illusion of yeah. this match actually meaning something and then promote Kofi and Randy next week. You've still got plenty of time. Well, to play devil's advocate, remember everyone was assuming it was going to be G.O.D. versus Briscoe's at G1 Supercard. Right. And then true, everything changed. So, I mean, technically, even though I don't think Kofi's going to lose, they could play it up like, well, yeah, we'll make it a different match for SummerSlam if it's somebody else besides Kofi as right. champion. So, I guess it... It doesn't totally kill believability in his upcoming match before the Orton match, but to me, I don't like it either. I'm with you there. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Well, Technically, he, it, you, you know, they you, could still have him lose even if it's advertised. Well, and what you could have done is just had Randy Orton come out and attack Kofi Kingston. During his match, maybe. Well, I mean, on SmackDown and then interfere in his match on Saturday. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and, during his match on Saturday. Yeah, so... But know. yeah, yeah, have them attack instead of just them talking. Right, right. So, I but I did think Orton cut a great promo on SmackDown, and I love the line: "I didn't have to fake a Jamaican accent, throw pancakes, or shake my ass to win a title." Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really good. Uh, Orton's I, great at promos. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he is really good. And we really don't get to hear him very much anymore. So, speaking of Orton, before we move on, he had this weird interaction with Will Ospreay online. In fact, it was so strange. So, I don't know if Will Ospreay has, like, a WWE Twitter magnet attached to his profile or something or to his tweets. But, like, he attracts all these WWE guys. First, it was Seth Rollins, as we talked about on our podcast a few weeks ago. They had this whole Twitter beef. This is a little different. There was no harsh words or anything exchanged. But Will Ospreay tweeted out something like, you know, set a goal and work towards it and you'll be happy every day. And then Randy Orton's like, it's impossible to be happy every day and to know what you're doing and to 
blah, 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 and to plan ahead. Because Will Osprey would say something about, plan ahead every day, you'll be happy. Orton's like, you can't do that. And then Will Osprey's like, well, you can try. What is this with these WWE guys? Why are they tweeting me? Um, and he's like, all respect to you, sir, or whatever he said. And then Orton was like, why don't you come over here and have a match with me? Hashtag Orton versus Osprey. And then Osprey was like, man, you've done everything over there. You know, I'm good where I am, but, you know, you could leave for a little while and then go back later, so why don't you come where I am? <laughs> and then he put also hashtag Orton versus Osprey. <laughs> so I think that's kind of a neat little back and forth, but random as hell. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it, it seems like they're trying to lay the gra- groundwork for uh, Osprey to come to WWE and have all these, these feuds with all these people. No, <laughs> that would be the death of Osprey. <laughs> um, I think he's different than Ricochet. I think, I don't know. I just think he thrives outside of WWE. I agree, I agree. Uh, Bray Wyatt uh, has been revealed and now is attacking people, and he still did the Firefly Funhouse on on SmackDown, so I love that. I mean, we were worried that he wouldn't still have these awesome video packages if he was in the ring again, but now that fear has been for now squashed <laughs> yeah. for now. Oh. But knock on wood, because things could change in an instant with WWE. Two other things I wanted to t- quickly touch on on SmackDown. I thought it was very interesting when uh, Shawn Michaels was on. Uh, Miz's talk show and Dolph Ziggler interrupted him and said how embarrassing it was when he got back in the ring in Saudi Arabia and Shawn Michaels actually agreed with him and said yeah that was embarrassing but then he added not as embarrassing as being a second right HBK but kind of interesting that HBK knew it wasn't a great match for him yeah and for him to acknowledge it I guess is the best thing I'm trying to say yeah I could see that but <laughs> There's a lot of these moments lately where they're having superstars say things that are, like, true or that are real. Yeah. Like, the heels, like Sammy being like, oh, you over-rely on legends and it's embarrassing, just go home. Like, that's echoing some of the things people are saying online. Mm-hmm. So they, they pull some reality. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know that was something that was scripted like oh yeah admit that you think it was embarrassing because everyone's saying that it looked bad and it was terrible or he could have really thought that which i'm he very well could have i don't know yeah could have um the other thing i thought was interesting or i I think would make the shane versus kevin owens match a little more interesting so kevin owens has to quit if he loses to shane yeah why not have a stipulation that shane has to quit wrestling like, he can still be the boss and, and show up on TV yeah. or whatever. No more wrestling for Shane McMahon if he loses. Because he can't not wrestle. I know. They want him in WrestleMania to do an absurd spot. Well, That's he... stupid. I don't want to see any more Shane spots. I just can't believe how much of a 180 from when he came back. Everyone was so pumped up and excited. It was one of the biggest pops in the longest time that I can remember. I marked out. Because I used to love Shane, even in the ring, because he took a lot of risks. And yes, I, I feel like kind of weird now that my whole philosophy has changed about him because he's still taking those same risks and you know those risks are draw are jaw drop oh god not again i can't (laughs) speak they're jaw dropping but i'm over it it's like it's too much and it's taken away from the current dudes yep so we'll see i i I mean i i would like to see that stipulation in there so that people would really have a reason to get behind kevin owens at SummerSlam. Uh, one final thing you noted it, at the beginning of the show from NXT, we finally got to see Keith Lee against Damian Priest. Good match, but disappointed on how short it was. Plus, they didn't do a lot of their stuff. Yeah, I mean... So I'm, I'm assuming they're going to have another match at some point down the road. <laughs> I, I would think that they would have to, but uh, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. It's They've got so little time to work with. It's like the opposite problem of yeah. Raw and SmackDown. Really not so much SmackDown, more Raw. But yeah, NXT is so condensed, and they've got a lot of talent there. Not everyone has the chance. And in fact, you know, we were scrolling through commercials, scrolling through. We see there's like 13 minutes left, and that's when the match gets started, only right. like 13 minutes. And it wasn't like they had a bunch of filler. I mean, you you had some promos, you had wrestling. Uh, you had the Cole and Gargano stuff. So, uh, yeah, maybe maybe that's going to be the biggest thing is if they do go to FS1 and get two hours, we'll get to actually see more of the NXT uh, roster, which, like you said, is stacked. Yeah, I mean, it would be cool. if Even if it was just two hours, that would be the perfect length, not three. But, yeah, I really wish I would have seen more from them because I know what they can do. Yes. Especially Damian Priest. We saw some great things 
with him in Ring of Honor, including a great match with him versus Ishii, mm-hmm. who we'll be talking about later. Yeah. We saw that in person. Yeah, that was it. Uh, that was here in New Orleans. Yep, at it's Super Card of Honor. Yep. Uh, we'll actually get to Ring of Honor here in a second too, but we want to talk about uh, a promotion that had been partnered with Ring of Honor, but that partnership is coming to an end as NWA is going to go their own way. Yeah, lots of people are report- reporting that they're done with Ring of Honor. Nothing, it doesn't seem like it's contentious or anything. I think their commitments are just up. And it's, I think NWA wants to go back and focus on doing their own thing. And I'm guessing it's just going to be on their YouTube still. Unless they've got something else in the works. I don't know. But that's interesting choice. I don't necessarily agree with it because... I actually liked the partnership a lot because I think it gave NWA a little bit of a bigger platform. Uh, But you could say that they already benefited from getting the bigger exposure and now they can go back and capture that audience that they had been exposed to, bring them back to their YouTube channel and just keep them engaged that way. They already have been exposed to the amount of people that they're going to get exposed to. It probably won't be much more. I guess one could argue that, but I just think... It was an interesting partnership for both companies. Ring of Honor benefited because they had a few more matchups, a few more talent to work with. And some cool stories and like all this on commentary with the other guys. That was great. That's what I'm going to miss the most probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, uh, and and on NWA's side, you know, I love the 10 Pounds of Gold series, but who are they going to go and have matches? We were talking about this, you and I, during the week. Who are they going to go and have Nick Aldis face yeah. in random promotions where Ring of Honor, at least, it has some prestige? Right. You know, what promotion is Nick is going to travel to next? Is he going to face James Ellsworth again? Right. Which he did once already before their partnership with Ring of Honor? Right. And look, they can still do all those things and still come back to Ring of Honor once or twice a year. That's why I think severing the ties, I think, is a mistake. Well... You know, maybe they want to go and partner with bigger people. Who knows? Maybe they want to do something with Impact. Yeah, maybe. They got an Impact guy now. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. With or, Eli Drake, you know. Or who knows? Maybe they got something in the back room going on where they may show up at AEW. You never know. We'll see. Uh, but what we do know is uh, they are done with Ring of Honor, but Ring of Honor forged ahead with two big shows this weekend. Uh, a new... Uh, uh, philosophy for Ring of Honor. We talked about it last week. These were TV tapings, and but they made much of the show available to Honor Club members. I love this. I think it makes Honor Club really, really valuable to fans. Because before, yes, the live house shows were awesome, but you still had to wait weeks to see what happened to their TV tapings if you were watching it live on TV mm-hmm. or on Fight TV because they have the episodes for free on there. And they have the f- episodes on Honor Club as well. But it's still like you'd have to wait, and it was ridiculous. Now you get to see it instantly, and I love it. Yep. And I think it's a great reward to entice people to sign up to be Honor Club members. And, you know, NWA might be done with Ring of Honor. But we're not done with Ring of Honor, so I'm happy to keep supporting them. I liked what I saw from them with these shows. I do want to see another Briscoe's Bouncers match. I was kind of rooting for the Bouncers. I, I know I'm fast-forwarding through the first show, but uh, throughout the whole weekend, I was really, really excited for whoever ended up facing the Bouncers, whatever that match was going to be. And it ended up being the Briscoes won the tag team titles back, so they were slated to face the Bouncers at Mass Hysteria. I thought it was good, but I want to see more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, Saturday night, the Bouncers actually were in a triple threat tag team match, but at the end of the match, uh, Vinny Marcella and the Kingdom attack the Bouncers, and Vinny Marcella puts out the cigar on Bruiser's chest, which... Uh, the you know, night after at Mass Hysteria, he had like this foil stuff on like it. Like this bandage and yeah. yeah. And uh, he had a mark there. So uh, that was interesting setting up a rivalry with them. And that was early in the show. And all, earlier, Matt Taven had had a great promo. But uh, the thing we were looking forward to the most was G.O.D. versus the Briscoes. And man, what a match that was. God, it was brutal. I loved it. Just it, it harkened back to their match in Chicago which was also brutal but this one had like more weapons and to me what sticks out is the finish more than anything I think the whole match was great but the finish was just awesome and jaw-dropping I mean with Mark way up top just going down onto the table that was scary well and don't forget earlier in the match Mark did that insane 
flip off the chair where he flipped over and went through Tongaloa on the table on the floor. Oh, yeah. And he landed, like, super hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that was insane. Uh, Caprice the whole time, like, yelling. Yeah. I love when Caprice yells. And, like, he really added to the match. <laughs> when, when Jay Briscoe oh got the God. ladder, he's screaming like crazy. Yeah. Uh, the one funny thing, and it shows how good the Briscoes are. So they tried to do a belt where they, or a spot where they were going to use the championship belt. Jay went to toss it, or Mark went to toss it to Jay. I can't remember whichever to use it, but he threw it too far. And, yeah. And Jay couldn't catch it, but immediately didn't miss a beat and like picked up a chair and beat up god so uh, that to me that's the kind of thing that you know he could have somebody less experienced might have froze in the ring like oh that spot went bad he just rolled with the punches yeah. and uh, I thought that was fantastic. Something I really liked on commentary that they emphasized that the Briscoes almost don't even have to think. They're almost like programmed to know what each other, what each of them are going to do because they're brothers. And they were like, but the only people who can match up to that are God because they're brothers. So I really liked how they played up that whole angle where they're like so in sync. Each team's in sync with each other. So it's kind of like almost like God was such a threat because it was the only people who could match Briscoe's right. in their whole chemistry thing. I, I liked that a lot. I thought it painted a great story on commentary. And and the crowd, again, was pro-God. They were, but they were louder than usual right. for the Briscoe's, which is good because in some buildings, it's just totally silent for the Briscoe's, which I cannot believe. They're like one of the best tag teams ever. So although on commentary, they were talking about brother tag teams there's one brother tag team that that they didn't mention of course that's the bucks and there was this mysterious tweet from matt kind of soon after the ring of honor show saying bucks will always be a dirty word in this business and you know i don't know if it has something to do with people not talking about the bucks in ring of honor anymore I'm really not sure because some people in the comments of Matt's comment were saying that. Like, oh, is it because they didn't talk about uh, how great the Bucks were in the tag team division in Ring of Honor? But I understand because, you know, they left. You know, what are they, they're supposed to talk about people who left? Yeah, but they've talked about people who have left in the past. So, so they, they'll that, talk about Kevin. I guess they'll talk about Kevin Owens slash Steen. Well, in fact, I was going to actually Daniel bring Bryan. that up. Yeah, so that's... Yeah. You're right, know. you're right. I don't know. I thought it was suspicious. I mean, you're talking about brothers in wrestling, and you don't bring up the Young Bucks? It, yeah, I know. It, and then they were talking about great uh, tag team uh, matches in Ring of Honor and how great Ring of Honor is for tag team wrestling. And they mentioned, you know, like the Hardys. Right. And that's, they mentioned the Hardys winning the titles, and that was against the Bucks. Right. So they totally left the Bucks out. Yeah. So I guess that is a little suspicious, but I understand some hurt feelings. Yeah, I don't, I mean, as much as the Young Bucks elevated Ring of Honor, it, you know, we've talked about it before. They helped make all in happen. Right. So, they really did. Yeah. No, I, I don't get it. Uh, but, you know, you know, there's all sorts of little contentious little things in wrestling. Right? I know, I know. It's it's a crazy biz. <laughs> uh, so, G.O.D., uh, Mark hits that doomsday off the ladder through Tama Tonga. They win their 11th Ring of Honor tag team title. But they have to defend it the next night against the Bouncers. Yep. They got to defend it because them boys are dem champs, yeah. as you said in the little opening <laughs> teaser. I really like that. Dem boys... Are them champs. <laughs> um, I thought the bouncers had a really good accounting for themselves in this match, too, even if, even though, as you said earlier, it could have been even longer. But, you know, right out of the gate, Bruiser doing that cannonball down to the floor on Jay, I thought was unbelievable. Uh, just the whole match, I thought, was really good. You know what? It's not in the match, but right after the match, the exchange of respect, mm -hmm. I think, was really cool because you do not see that from the Briscoes very often at no. all. So, you know, they were cheersing with beer. I just thought that was very unique and unusual for a Briscoes match, and it made it different. That really added a lot to it, even though it wasn't, of course, anything in ring in the match. It was something afterwards, but, but it still added a lot to me, personally. Yeah, it spoke to the fact that the Briscoes respect the bouncers, Respected that they had a great match there, and uh, I thought that was awesome. And, you know, we kind of thought that was going to be the end of it, but then all of a sudden, here comes G.O.D., which I had wondered whether they were just going to be on the one show or if they'd show up the next night. Boy, they show up in a big way. <laughs> Brutal beatdown of the Briscoes by God. And, man, 
they were bleeding everywhere, the Briscoes. And in fact, Tama Tonga was walking out, you're bleeding! You better wipe that off, or whatever he said. He was being all smug like Tama Tonga usually is. Yeah, well, he also said chicken farmers, chicken... Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> that was God, great, too. It was great. But uh, I definitely want the Briscoes to win. They announced that they're going to have a Ladder Wars match. Heck yeah, man. Some of my favorite matches in Ring of Honor ever have been Ladder War matches. So pretty excited about this. And it's the perfect way to end off this Briscoes God feud. What better way than, like, such a brutal match? Yep. I had to laugh, though, how uh, the... G.O.D. was disrespectful of the belts, and uh, Ian, Ian, oh my god, he got so mind. passionate. He was like, why? Why? They throw them after they win them, and then when the money starts rolling in, they have no problem being the champions, and then when they can't be them anymore, they're jealous, and they want to have a championship match. Just ask for a rematch. Don't come out here and act like this, like garbage. <laughs> he didn't say garbage here, I don't think, but <laughs> Every- so Everybody's Ian. human garbage to Ian. <laughs> yeah, I love Ian's commentary. I love when he's mad at people. Uh... Going back to Manhattan Mayhem, great match, a triple threat match between Kenny King, Jay Lethal, and Matt Taven. It was supposed to be a one-on-one, and Kenny King kind of talked his way into the yeah. match. I thought the video package before the match even started with uh, Jay Lethal just reflecting back on Supercard, uh, G1 Supercard, and riding the train to MSG, and it was the most exciting train ride he's ever taken into the city, and then the most depressing train ride he'd ever taken going home. I thought that was just such a well-done video yeah. package. Uh, so <laughs> I had to laugh when they go to do the handshakes, and uh, instead of offering his hand, Kenny King offered a, another appendage. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. whatever. I thought that was pretty funny. That was funny. Uh, Taven's suicide dive onto both. Uh, was awesome, and then then flying over the rope to take out Kenny King. Uh, Taven, again, we've talked about this before, very underrated. He's, mm-hmm. he's not getting the credit he deserves for, for being such a good champion. People hate him. Yep. But that's what a heel's supposed to do, but people just are like, some people just hate him as a champion, regardless of his heel character. They're just like, we're not into him, we can't, we can't get into him. I just don't, I just don't understand that. I really like him, I think his character works great. Yeah. I mean, coming into that show, uh, doing his promo in a Red Sox jersey. That made you happy, oh. but it didn't make the crowd, the local crowd, happy. <laughs> Screw the Yankees fans. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, we're recording this after the Red Sox just beat the Yankees 19-3, to so I'm particularly giddy. And Of course, I'll end up eating crow when the Yankees win the next three games of the series. But. And it was a history-making game. They didn't just beat them. Yeah, the most runs they've ever scored in their 2,000-plus meetings against the Yankees. Yep, there you but go. But like I said, it's the karma will come around and the Yankees will win the next three games of the series. Maybe. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, Hopefully end, not. End of the match, uh, Taven hits Climax on King but pins Jay Lethal. Jay Lethal tries to offer his hand and instead gets a uh, shot to the uh, family jewels yes. instead. So... Uh, that rivalry between Lethal and Taven seems like it will continue, and I'm all for that. I'm all for that, too, because I've really always loved that rivalry. Uh, right after that, and sandwiched between that and Briscoes and God was uh, uh, Bandito and Has. Oh, actually, I- I'm getting ahead of myself. You're mixing ba- up everything. Black, Williams, Haskins, and Bandito went against PCO, Squirrel, King, and Flip that night, but then the following night there was supposed to be a six-man tag, but... Uh, Flip was not cleared for action, and neither was uh, Williams. So they made it a tag match between uh, Bandito and Haskins against Skrull and PCO. And what I liked early on in this, and I didn't know this story before, but they talked about how PCO mentored Kevin Steen and, yeah. and really got him going. That was interesting. And then Kevin Steen, now of course Kevin Owens, convinced PCO that he should give wrestling one last run and... And now look where he's at. He's one of the most over guys in Ring of Honor. I would say that's pretty darn good advice. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, Bandito doing his normal crazy stuff when he did the Spanish fly of PCO off the top rope. Just awesome stuff. But uh, the Villain Enterprises gets the win because Flip uh, gives a distraction. But now we've... Flip's elbow. Yeah. He barely moved that thing. And Flip uh, injury news with him this week. PWG said that he's not going to be in their next show. So I don't know what that means, if the injury's worse, or he just doesn't want to take any additional bookings besides Ring of Honor stuff. I really don't know if it's really gotten worse since we saw him at the first show. Yeah, but he, he didn't show. really look that good Saturday. I know. He wasn't even moving it at all. Yeah. I mean, I know it was in a brace, but like he 
wasn't like even moving in the brace. Yeah, and so he wasn't cleared to wrestle on Sunday in Lowell, and so we'll keep an eye on what's up with Flip, who's just kind of been unlucky here with yeah. injury after injury. Uh, kind of unfortunate for him. Uh, overall, I thought both shows were good. It was a fun weekend of watching Ring of Honor Wrestling and look forward to their next thing, which is that uh, summer supercard show in Toronto, which should be a lot of fun. And in that, uh, Alex Shelley will take on Matt Taven for the title. Yep, so, and we'll see that ladder match. Yeah, so can't wait for that. Uh, when we come back, we will head to Japan, where Kenta and Moxley continue to roll in the G1. We'll get you caught up on nights 5 through 8 of the G1 Climax 29 when we return. Two-Face Wrestling Talk is proud to be sponsored by Wrestling Travel. Check them out on Twitter at Wrestling Travel. Also go to their website, wrestlingtravel.org, to find out about all the exciting travel packages, including a travel package to All Out, which includes four nights hotel stay, StarCast Platinum Bracelet, and a lower bowl ticket across from the hard cam. They also have a very fun Wrestle Kingdom travel package, which includes round-trip airfare, five-night hotel near the Tokyo Dome, lower bowl tickets to both days of Wrestle Kingdom, and guided tours by being the Elite's fat ass masa come on who wouldn't want to hang out with masa i think that's like the coolest thing they offer (laughs) you get to have some time with him meet him interact with him he'll literally be hanging with you and you'd get to be a part of the first two-day wrestle kingdom which is going to be really special in my opinion they also have travel packages to wwe events including wrestlemania 36 which you can sign up for information at wrestlingtravel.org And they've got packages to the Royal Rumble as well, plus other events too. Check out their website. There are USA travel packages, but also UK travel packages. So whether you live in the UK or where we live in the United (laughs) States, you can find something for you. Also, don't forget they've got a friendly staff that can help you out. DM them on Twitter or contact them through their website. Thanks, Wrestling Travel. Our Two-Faced Wrestling Talk logo was inspired by Two-Face, the Batman animated series character, and his coin. The logo was designed by the talented and creative artist Eric Hudson. Eric creates wrestling-themed pieces as well as other pop culture art. He is also currently working on a Roddy Piper comic book. You can follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dreaded Dinosaur. You can also support his work by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash dreaded dinosaur. Please check out his work. And now back to Two-Face Wrestling Talk. All right, on to New Japan. We had four more shows since we were last with you. And uh, we're going to start with Night 5, which was A-Block action. Really good match early on between Archer and Kenta. Archer has shown up well in this tournament, but now he's lost two straight Meanwhile, Kenta, eight points, at, or at this point, six points, but uh, he continues to roll. I'm really surprised that they're letting him beat, like, everybody. Like, you know, Archer says, everybody dies, while <laughs> Kenta always wins, I guess. <laughs> or everybody loses to Kenta. I don't know. Either way, it's, like, crazy how dominant he's been in this tournament. But I guess it's just a statement to how serious, as I said last week, New Japan really takes him very seriously right now. Archer, though, I gotta say, he's in my like top three of the tournament. I love what he, his, they're doing with his singles push. I love it. His attitude is great. The crowd loves him. Oh man, like the, the chance for him. I've never heard like I'm getting ahead of myself because it's later on in the tournament. His match after this Kenta one that there was dueling chance. We'll talk about that right. later. But it's crazy how much people are chanting for him. It just says a lot about how his character work is really going very far with the audience. And I just. I think his wrestling is really on point right now, too. And, and again, his character work is so good. Uh, two things from that match stood out. One, he wants to slam Kent to the, to the floor, but all the young lions stand in oh, his yeah, way. Oh, yeah, this is great. And he's like, like, move! And then he's like, okay, F you then. And he slams Kenta. They catch him, but then he cannonballs into all of them. I thought great. it was awesome. And then later in the match, he he's leaning over K- Kenta, and he goes, hey, I know you. You're... It Tommy. <laughs> oh yeah, that was awesome. He used the f word before that, but <laughs> you're effing it Tommy. Yeah, that was really really good. But, Remember how I was like, why didn't he just say your Hoyt? Yeah, that, <laughs> I mean, you're not really Archer. Yeah, that would have been a great response. <laughs> I don't think that's an insult though, no, because it's more like you know, Hatami was when he was just squandering and doing nothing in NXT. 
Uh, so um, that is more offensive to say than the other way around. True, true. Uh, kind of surprised Kenta won with a, a submission on Archer there, even though Archer kind of dominated. So that was a fun match. Evil and Sonata went against each other. I thought that was a solid match with Evil winning, Okada beating Fale. I, I think it was surprising that Evil beat Sonata. Oh, yeah. I thought it would be the other way around. Yeah. Just because I thought that Sonata would be the one getting like the singles push more so than Evil. But man, when they had them go up against each other with all that tag team history and everything, I just... I didn't imagine it going that way. But yeah, solid match. Yep. Yeah. Okada and Fale. There was kind of some funny stuff where people were mocking Fale. Salute at one point. Red Shoes mocked it. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, Okada won by taking out Fale and Owens and Giotto. Uh, he stood over Fale and saluted too. So I thought that was pretty funny. I was so bummed that Sabre lost against Tanahashi. I was like, there's no way. He's going to lose this, and he lost it. I know. At that point, zero that made, points that at made that him point. Three. Yeah, so that was a, a bit of a surprise. And then the match of night five uh, Will Ospreay, Kota Ibushi. No surprise. It was unbelievable. You know, I don't like Kota Ibushi, but that match was flipping amazing. I loved so many things about that match. Well, uh, I, Kevin Kelly drops nuggets every now and then. And I love this one. He said, when Will Ospreay debuted in 2015, the media said that he's an English Ibushi. So I thought that was an interesting comparison. And uh, both guys uh, committing to New Japan Wrestling is another part of their storyline that they they told during that match. Yeah, I really I liked it a lot. I just thought so many good spots. I almost like it better than their previous meeting Yeah. at Wrestle Kingdom. Wasn't that at Wrestle Kingdom, I believe? Yeah. I, I almost liked it more for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe I was more excited about the in-ring action in this one. It felt longer. Yeah, it felt longer than their, which is funny because this has a shorter time limit than right. I think their Wrestle Kingdom one had. Uh, but I don't know, it just it flowed really well. It was so good, and there were so good little camera shots, like the one point where Osprey is hanging upside down and Ibushi's kind of leaning over, yeah. staring at him. I thought that was fantastic. There's only one problem with the match: who won? Yeah, it should have been Osprey. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because when Osprey lost this. I thought for sure he was going to beat Okada. I know. And, and then he didn't. Did I really thought, that. especially because he had lost so many times right. in matches against Okada. I thought, okay, well, they're pushing that on commentary. Surely this is going to be the time where he beats Okada finally. And they're going to push that. Like, oh, he finally did it. He proved that he could stand toe-to-toe and really be a competitor for Okada. But nope, it went the opposite way. I yep. can't believe it. Yep. Uh, and simply, <laughs> my bottom of my notes for that... What a match. It was fantastic. Yeah, for the uh, Ibushi Osprey match, yep, yeah. Yep. Uh, moving on, night six, the B block. Shingo knocked off Tai Chi, so Tai Chi, after, after a quick start, uh, starting to falter, as we'll, uh, we'll see later. Uh, Jeff Cobb versus Juice. A uh, little bit of a surprise that Cobb beats Juice there, uh, yeah. but I was kind of glad because I didn't want Cobb to just get buried in this tournament, which I was a little worried it was going in that direction. It, it had been going in that direction, so it's almost like he needed it, but uh, you know, you, at that point you're worried, oh no, is Juice going to falter now too? But he bounced back. Uh, Yanu beats uh, Jay White with that some shenanigans. That was amazing. Uh, with some brass knuckles to White's jewels. Yes, and- I'm so happy with that results well the only person happier was rocky romero as they kept saying he was the cheerleader for whoever was going against jay white and when he was smiling at the end gato uh comes over to him and goes what are you smiling about mf -er?" yeah it was great (laughs) i thought (laughs) gato i love when gato talks because he just kind of his his gravelly voice it just cracks me up for whatever reason it is pretty funny (laughs) he does have a very weird gruff voice uh, Naito, after starting 0-2, uh, gets the victory over Goto. Had to. Had to. Had to. And then... Uh, My favorite match of the whole tournament. So far. S- some people are saying Osprey Okada. I actually think Ishii Moxley is my favorite. Even including the Osprey matches. Osprey matches, they're close. But this Ishii's been the MVP for me. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Of the whole tournament. Well, we've been writing down matches throughout that we think are matches for potential recognition down the road and the common theme is they either have osprey or or ishii ishii in them (laughs) yep uh and it's funny so you had been taking a lot of the g1 notes and your notes are very short and concise i started to take notes during the 
Ishii Moxley match, and it's like three pages of notes, whereas <laughs> Paul's is like two sentences. So like, this is all my notes for Ishii Moxley. Well, you give it like a complete play by play. I just write like big things. Yeah, I know. I'm like, <laughs> I like how I see my notes. I can actually remember what happened with the match. It's all <laughs> well, yours. I'm like, I don't remember much of what happened except that I liked it. Well, like that, that Osprey Abushi match. I know I liked it, but your notes are not comprehensive. I have no idea. Well, I give, I I give some big moves in there. But see here, my comprehensive notes, I can see the great parts I liked. <laughs> like I loved when they were battling with the chairs. It was almost like a, a lightsaber battle where <laughs> Ishii and Moxley both have a chair. They swing it hard as heck, and the chairs just get destroyed. Yes. So awesome. Well, even before they even got going, the face-off in the ring was awesome. Like Ishii just charging at him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I loved it. Uh, I also have loved in this tournament the interaction between Moxley and Red Shoes. Uh, In this match, Red Shoes points for them to get back in the ring, and Moxley hugs Red Shoes. Uh, He's bowed to him. He's shaking his hand. He said he's sorry to Red Shoes, so yes. all that is very funny. Uh, the monster chops and forearms from Ishii, we've come to expect. In fact, there was even a better display of that uh, in Night 8 that we'll talk about a little later. But Moxley and, and Ishii are just so great at being brutal. And then Ishii pulls out a spot that nobody saw coming. <laughs> it's so unlike Ishii. Usually he's like ground and pound, ground and pound, really hard hitting guy. But then he takes to the sky and like literally vaults off the top of, you know, the top turnbuckle. It's insane. Down. To the outside, onto a table. Yeah, through Moxley, onto a table. It's not like him. He doesn't do stuff well, like that. And it wasn't like a bumbling. I mean, it was a beautiful splash. It yeah. was super fly-esque. I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah, and then he did another splash. Yeah, I mean, it was really, really good. Uh, and then, and then Moxley, he was doing superplexes too. Yeah. And like, like you said, you know, he was like vaulting off the top when he was doing the superplex. It wasn't just like they're falling straight down, right. like, you know, a heavy weight. It was like, he was launching them. Like, it's almost like he jumps off the rope to, to get a little more on the, it's, like more momentum. Yeah. yeah. That was great. And you know, I like Ishii's brutality, but I think someone who matches it was Moxley, and that's why it probably was my favorite match of the tournament so far. And I think Kevin Kelly said it best when he had this quote during his commentary. He says, this is the result of years of being told what to do, and left to his own accord now, the violent imagination of John Moxley has come into light. So I really like that it kind of shows you that John Moxley is on a different level now. He's not being told what to do, he's just going over the top, and he's really violent and brutal that was a perfect summary of Moxley now. Yep. And he even uh, kind of alluded to that in his post-match speech as well. Um, I, I just think, I don't, I, I guess I, my thing is I don't want them to keep over hyping that storyline that he's, you know, was told what to do. Okay. We, I like we, it. we get the point. I just hope they don't do it the whole tournament, but I had a question for you at the beginning of of that match. How do you think the rest of the New Japan roster feels about Moxley and really, by extension, Kenta? Because they both come in, and nobody's saying they're going to win the G1, but they might. And But they're both dominating in the G1 over guys who have been there. I think they're probably happy that they're bringing more eyes to the product and the promotion. And by association, them. Yeah. So to me, I I would think that a lot of them don't mind. Yeah, I guess I could see that, but I could also see some jealousy in place. Maybe too. so, maybe you know, so, but not unlike uh, when Ronda Rousey got the push in WWE, and there was some supposed je- jealousy of that. But you don't see any of that playing out. I mean, no, I'm just wondering. You know, you never know. It could exist. What's going on in the back? But I'm pretty sure, like you know, they're thinking, well, more eyes, more money. You know, more getting over. Can't hurt. Uh, what? The, and speaking of more getting over, that match with Ishii, don't you think that elevated Ishii? I mean, Ishii in our eyes is already elevated, but to like the casual fan who just tuned in to New Japan because Moxley's there, they don't know who Ishii is. Don't you think that they're saying, holy, yeah. who is this guy? I love him. This guy is amazing. That's what I'm thinking. And yeah, why wouldn't the New Japan town be like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, 
Ishii's more over now. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, so to me, I, I think it's a good thing. And the crowd was super behind Ishii in this match, the local crowd. I thought that was awesome. So moving on, well, night seven. Y- what? You, you got one more page of War and Peace here that you wrote uh, here. Anything, uh, anything Why don't else I just in? post them online, <laughs> r- write them you out should. or something? You should. That should be my, my Patreon bonuses, <laughs> is my typed out notes, complete notes. Uh, I did. There's one part where I say, holy, e- holy... <laughs> Ishii did a splash from top turn muggle to outside, which we already talked about, but it's just funny that I wrote, holy crap, basically. Well, uh, I did like that Moxley also at the end of the match talked about how his career was in a toilet bowl, says he is going to win the G1 or die try. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot the, uh, like the almost uppercut headbutt oh, yeah. that Ishii did to like Moxley's chin. Yeah, yeah. That was brutal. I loved it. Uh, and uh, Every minute of that match was great. Yeah, and I I think it was in the uh, night eight. There was also another comment about uh, the things he had to do in WWE. Uh, uh, no, actually, it was that in was the in the AEW, AEW video promo. about the pies. Yeah, about how you know being able to. Omega was putting on classics in Japan while I was, was going throw, around throwing cream pies in people's faces. Yes, yeah. and so, that was a great line. Yeah, so Moxley has been unshackled and uh, he's coming unhinged in <laughs> New Japan. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, let's go to night seven. Uh, a block continuing then. Uh, Fale I'm, and ZSJ, and you just love the ending of this. I do because I think it's a unique way to have ZSJ go over Fale because you wouldn't think that he would normally go over someone so much bigger and so much stronger who's supposed to be a monster. But uh, man, so they're both fighting outside of the ring, but. The count's going, just starts. It starts getting higher and higher, and ZSJ runs into the ring. Fale tries to run behind him. It's like 18, then it becomes 19. You usually are used to people sliding in at the very last second. Fale can't get there, and ZSJ wins because of the count out. Yeah. That was really cool. Funny way to get his uh, first win of the tournament. But it is... Alarming that it's the first win. Yeah, I mean, he's got no chance. I know. I, I, I really wish he would have been racking up more points before this. Um, Another match I really love, Tanahashi versus Archer. I think one of the greatest things about this match, this is what I was alluding to earlier about Archer being really over. There was dueling chance against the Ace of New Japan. Mm-hmm. The local crowd was so loud for Archer. It was crazy. It wasn't all go Ace. It was right. Archer. Go ace. It was crazy. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. I loved it. Uh, I think it's really a testament to how good Archer is right now. How he's getting over. How much work he's putting in. And like you said, his character work right now is top notch. Yeah. Two more great quotes in this match. During the match, he yells at Tanahashi, "I'm the ace now. You ain't." Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then later he says, "I'm from Texas," and puts on the Texas clover leaf, oh, which yeah, is Tanahashi about that. loves to do. So I thought. Again, just great character work by Archer. I don't. I think now Archer's lost a couple in a row. I don't. I don't hold a lot of hope of him winning the tournament. No. But I think he is certainly establishing himself as a single star in New Japan. Regardless of if he, you know, doesn't win, it doesn't matter. He's gotten more over by being in this tournament. Yeah. And so goal accomplished. Uh, next match after that was Kenta versus Evil. Uh, Kenta, with a little character work of his own, wiping the uh, eye paint off of Evil and wiping it onto his own face. Yeah. I thought that was kind of funny. And uh, look, Kenta wins again, beating Evil. I'm really surprised that Kenta has, like, perfect score so far. It's it's crazy. Well, and you wanted to talk about you're not a big fan of the way he executes the go-to-sleep. No, it looks sloppy to me. And I might get some heat from saying this, but I really... Like, especially in this Evil match, it looked like the knee hit hit Evil's chest, not his face at all. Almost like Evil blocked it. It was... Yeah, it didn't look effective at all, and I was like, that is sloppy. And I remember in the match against Ibushi, I didn't think it connected well. Now, it might have been shot better than where we were sitting at, and maybe we saw an angle where it totally looked like it didn't connect at all. But same thing in the Evil match, we were looking at that on TV, not in person. And the Evil match with Kenta, it just didn't look like the knee connected at all, and it took me out of it. And I'm like, if they're going to have him win this tournament, that need, move needs to be executed perfectly to a T, or else I am not buying it that he's going to win this G1. Yeah, I, I don't want to like support someone he's, who doesn't like they can really execute the move like he's got a if he's gonna beat okada for example he's yeah. got to deliver like two of those 
perfectly. And they have to be perfect. Yeah. Yes, they have to look like they're connecting. They have to look brutal because I have not been impressed, especially in that match against Evil. Uh, next up was Sonata versus Ibushi. Uh, great early sequence in this match. Later in the match, there was a great brutal sequence where they were exchanging uh, kicks in the middle of the ring and blows. I thought, I thought this was a great match again for Ibushi, and I thought Sonata delivered well. But now Sonata, just two points, he loses I'm, again. Another person I'm really surprised, like just like ZSJ. Wow, Sonata doing so poorly when he had just been really, it looked like getting the singles push and everything. But this is the G1. Not everyone can win everything, right. you know? So it's really no surprise. I mean, even Ibushi I thought would have more points. So all in all, eh, it is what it is. It's not going to hurt him too much in the long run. He's going against some of the best heavyweights in New Japan. Uh, you know, it's hard for everybody in the G1. Uh, so Ibushi beats Sonata. And then that sets up the aforementioned Osprey versus Okada match. This was a great match. I really loved it. Uh, I I really loved it, but again, I, I gotta say, I like the Ishii Moxley match better, but <laughs> this was still amazing. Osprey is the other MVP of the tournament, in my opinion. I think he's had some of the greatest matches. I mean, I, back to night one in Dallas, the Archer match, and this is no different. You've got him going against the best in New Japan with Okada. But again, I'm just surprised with the direction they went because just the emphasis on commentary as i said earlier about him never winning against okada and then he doesn't win again yeah kind of makes him look weaker yeah I, you know I, I was surprised i really thought osprey was going to win this match you know i thought during this match osprey did some great selling you know t you know his neck injury you know okada working that but then osprey fires back with that chop that was just we were both like, oh, my God, it was so loud. And you you were like, uh-oh, Okada's chest is going to look terrible again. Just from one chop, <laughs> yeah. Okada has a very sensitive chest. It feels like it's always, like, bleeding after ch monster chops especially. And that one was super brutal. You could hear it echoing throughout the arena, it felt like. And then I really thought Osprey was going to win it. He gets this drop kick that was almost a, a version of Shane McMahon's kind of coast-to-coast thing, but obviously better and prettier. Yeah, oh, yeah. He gets a second Oscutter. Lots of reversals. Yep, yep. Uh, Oscar reversing the Rainmaker. Uh, then, uh, oh, Okada kicked out of that beautiful shooting star press from Osprey. And so then you're like, all right, Okada's going to win. And sure enough, after a ton of reversals, Okada hits the Rainmaker. Yeah. And oh, so Okada... I really wanted Osprey to win. Yeah, but Okada wins again. And so uh, setting up that matchup against uh, Kenta. Yep, I can't wait to see that. It seems like that would... I mean, we've still got a lot of matches left, but it almost feels like that, that's going to determine the winner of the block. It almost feels like that, yeah. And I'm not trying to be super harsh on Kenta. No. I'm just saying I like Kenta, but the finisher has been looking sloppy. That's all I'm saying. I really do like Kenta yeah. a lot. And I was so happy when he won on the first night. But again, I just want to see very crisp knees at the end because everyone else in New Japan is really crisp a lot of the time. All right, finally, night eight, uh, Juice beats Yano despite uh, the attempts at some chicanery. Tai Chi beats Goto, which was a big win for Tai Chi. Uh, I like Shingo Moxley a lot. I, Surprised that Shingo's losing, but come on, Moxley's on a hot streak here. He, I guess he had to win if they're going to elevate him the way I think they are. And again, another little bit of knowledge. They, they dropped in the fact that Shingo and Moxley were in the same faction in Dragon Gate in the United States. So yeah. interesting that they have a history together. I give zero Fs, as Mox said, in the match. That's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, another great uh, line. And then he uh, actually submitted Shingo, which uh, was which a Which was unusual, spot. yeah. And that's they said it was the first time Shingo tapped out in New Japan, so. Yeah, yeah. So, that's what they said, yeah. yeah. So uh, Moxley rolls on. He's uh, the top of the B block with eight points. Meanwhile, Jay White was looking for a win. He had to win this because they were saying, you know, they were playing at the storyline, got to get six wins in a row. So this is the first of, I guess had, they're going to start playing at that storyline with him, that it's not won, over. Because he had won his first six last year and then dropped right. his last three. So they're saying, oh, it'll be yes, the inverse. Exactly. <laughs> and so, yes, he had to win here. It almost felt like you knew it going in. It sucks that the win that he gets had to be against Cobb yeah. first. Yeah. Especially because Cobb hasn't done so well in this tournament. But... I don't know. There was no other way. You have to have White win this because he's one of the top guys, a former IWGP heavyweight champion. You can't just have him go zero the whole time. Right. 
Uh, I, I know I'm referring to a lot of great lines in the ring, but that's part of what has made New Japan so entertaining for me. Jay White uh, says to Gato, I got a plan. And he goes up and he tries to take down uh, Cobb. And when Cobb overpowers him, he goes out of the ring and he goes, all right, that didn't work. That's a big man. Yeah, yeah, it's a big man. <laughs> so that interaction between him and Gato was pretty funny. Of course, White winning it dirty with a low blow and then hitting the Blade Runner. And that set up Ishii versus Naito, uh, which was the match of the night for of Night course. 8. <laughs> yeah, Ishii again, no surprise. He's had the best matches, in my opinion. He's had so many great matches. I really like this one a lot. Uh, Ishii spitting out blood at one point. Yeah, right early in the match yeah. after their confrontation. I don't know when he... He uh, got hit in the mouth, but he did, and he was spitting blood. The sequence of the match for me was there was a stretch where Ishii alternating bef- between forearms and chops to Naito, and I counted at least 18 of each. Yeah. And every time Naito would start to fall and sink to his, his butt and collapse, Ishii would pick him up and hit him again. Yep. I thought that was just so funny. And Naito's like, oh, God. <laughs> he was beaten down. But... Uh, but he would rally. Unfortunately, I know yeah. you were sad to see him beat Ishii. I was like, no, <laughs> but it is what it is. Now Ishii's lost, you know, again. And and Naito's won two in a row now, yep. so he's got life again. And You have to have some of the people have some life who had been losing in the early matches. So this balances everything out, and this is the way it has to be. Yeah, but at this, t- at this point, Moxley's kind of running away with it. But we said the same thing about Jay White last year. Again, he he was running away with it, and he didn't even win his block. So, You know, uh, all I know definitively is that this is one of the best G1s ever, and I'm really happy with watching it. It's been awesome. No matter who wins, I really don't care. The tournament itself has been awesome, has yielded some really incredible matches. Well, you Match of the year candidates all around. You laughed last week. You, You saw it in my notes when I said that, New Japan is better than AEW. Yeah, I did laugh. Right now, I'm sticking by that because the new, and not just, I mean, obviously. Well, better than WWE, too. Oh, or... well, yeah, better than anything. New Japan is the best thing going by far to me because the the characters are entertaining and I, the wrestling is just out of this world. Such a far cry difference from your attitude when you first started watching, <laughs> when you really couldn't get into it very much. I remember the first G1 you and I watched together, you watched one block only. We watched, like, block A. You're like, yeah. I just want to watch the block where I could relate to some of the people. Well, guys are, I had heard are, of, yeah. Are, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Guys you could relate to because you knew who they were at one point. And you didn't want to watch the other block. I'm like, this is no way to watch a G1. I was like, never again. And now you're super into yeah, it. Yeah, so. now I'm having to drag you along as you're... You're not dragging yes, me along. Yes, as you... I get tired. I know, that's what I'm saying. You're you, not dragging you, me you along. As you fall asleep at night. I like G1. I just get tired. I'm tired right now. <laughs> I could go to sleep on this podcast table. That's well, easily. Then I guess we better wrap it up. And, yes. Uh, we will wrap it up by announcing our contest winners. We told you uh, a couple weeks ago that we were going to have a contest to win some authentic Eric Hodson artwork. All elite wrestlers, poster print, really beautiful artwork by one of our favorite wrestling artists out there. One of the most talented guys I know, Eric Hodson. And so we chose two names at random out of uh, the several dozen choices. And uh, our two winners are at GoRedZilla, so at G-O-R-E-D-Z-I-L-L-A, and... At Dave Pazeski, our great friend, good guy Dave Pazeski. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dave, and thanks so much, Go Redzilla. We're really happy that you guys won, that you guys retweeted the tweet and followed us. And, and we'll get your info and get uh, get your stuff out to you as soon as we can. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, that'll be sooner than later. Thanks for supporting us and congratulations. Yeah, and that's uh, that's gonna do it for this week's show. And uh, we got plenty more G1 to look ahead to. I think there will be another four shows before we do uh, our next podcast. That will be our main thing we'll be focusing on next week, I assume. Yep. You know, things are kind of settling a little tiny bit, but they're always picking back up soon after they settle. So don't worry. Yeah. There'll be way more wrestling for us to review quite soon. Well, and G1 uh, will keep us busy nev- till then. And you never know when there's going to be news breaking. Like, like we said, there were so many things that came out this week. Yeah, uh, some you- things today. Yeah. yeah. So who knows what's going to come out next week, but we'll be on top of it and be here to discuss. Yep, but until then, that's it for us. That's the finish.